Alabama wins the SEC, and it hurts so good. How Jalen Hurts led an improbable fourth quarter comeback, even Hollywood couldn't have scripted any better. Plus, three high school football teams in Georgia were hoping to play in that very same stadium for a state title, but had to get past the final four this weekend. It's all on the last call, and it starts right now. Welcome back to The Last Call. I'm your host, Justin Holbrock. Still trying to catch my breath and comprehend that instant classic that was the SEC Championship. The national title rematch lived up to the hype and some. And without further ado, let's run it back. All week and really all year, Georgia and Alabama have been answering questions about their overtime thriller. And the most important question, who would win if they played again? was settled in Atlanta yesterday. Nick Saban and the Tide have won their games by at least 20 points, and they were a 12-point favorite against the Dogs. They didn't like that too much. Late in the first quarter, Dogs in the red zone, a place they've struggled all year, but not this time. Isaac Nada snags the first score of the game, and Georgia leads 7-0. Last play of the first quarter, Josh Jacobs gets the handoff, a hard run up the middle. He's called down at the one, but don't worry, he'd score two plays later to tie the game at seven early in the second quarter. DeAndre Swift has been Mr. Reliable all year and he comes through once again. Nine yard tutty and the dogs are back in front 14-7 with seven and a half minutes before the half, but they're not done. Next Georgia drive, Swift out of the backfield, catches it. Yes, sir. Swift's second touchdown of the game. 21 points are the most Bama has given up in the first half of this year, but the Tide were able to close the gap before half. 11-yard run from Damian Harris to the one. Jacob scores again on the next play. And stop me if this sounds familiar, but Georgia leads Alabama at the break. Dogs, though, not on a short leash to start the second half. Fromm hits Riley Ridley for the 23-yard touchdown, and Georgia has a 14-point lead once again. But Georgia fans know a lead against Tua Tungvaloa isn't safe. Or is it? Tua's pass is picked off by J.R. Reed. Tua had two interceptions through 12 games, and now he has two picks in this game, both inside the red zone. We had yet to see a touchdown of more than 25 yards. Well, here it is, 55 yards from Tua to Jalen Waddell and the Tide, starting to give Georgia fans some flashbacks they'd rather not have. Seven-point game heading into the fourth. Early in the fourth, Tua goes down with an ankle injury after getting stepped on, and in comes Jalen Hurts. Benched in last year's title game, named QB2 in September, watched on as Tua became a Heisman darling. Here's his chance. Rolls out to the right and converts his fourth third down of the drive in style. Tutter to Jerry Judy, and we're tied at 28 with five minutes left. Ensuing drive, dogs get to midfield, but face a fourth and 11 from the 50. Despite Bama's starting defense on the field, Kirby Smart tries the fake and fields, runs out of field for a huge turnover on downs. Two passes put Bama back inside the red zone. Less than two minutes left. Oh, it hurts so good. Jalen Hurts, 26-2 as a starter, gives Alabama its first lead of the game, and that score would prove to be the game-winning touchdown for the SEC title. Confetti reigns once again on the kings of the SEC as Alabama wins its fourth SEC title in five years. What was Georgia's revenge after last year's national championship turned into Jalen's. He came back and led the team to a game-tying touchdown and then the game-winning touchdown to give the Tide another SEC title under Nick Saban. It's a great feeling. We've seen we lost it. We didn't have a chance to go last year and come back this year and be one of the top teams in the own country. The winner is a great feeling. It's crazy because most people don't know I've had three to four IVs in the last two or three days. So just to come in and just show like the heart, the heart and how I feel like I gave it my all out here today is huge. We're used to not seeing Tua Tungavailoa in the fourth quarter. He was in for less than three minutes before coming out but not because of another insurmountable Alabama lead. The sophomore quarterback and Heisman favorite who led the Tide to a second half comeback in last year's national championship against Georgia went down with an ankle injury. In his place came the man he replaced, Jalen Hurts. Trailing by seven late in the fourth, Hurts led the offense down the field, converting on four third downs, including a 10-yard touchdown to Jerry Judy to tie the game at 28 with 5.19 left in the game. 
On the ensuing possession, Georgia went for a questionable fake punt on 4th and 11 from midfield, but was rolled back by the Tide, giving Bama the ball at their own 48 with three minutes left on the clock. Hurts connected with Irv Smith Jr. across the middle for 19 yards, and on the very next play, he scrambled to the right, filing Jalen Waddle along the sideline to put them inside the red zone. The Tide, which had not led all game, were a field goal away from taking the lead. But the field goal unit wouldn't be needed like last year's title game. Hurts took the QB keeper 15 yards to put Bama up 35-28 with just over a minute left in the game. The defense held out to give Alabama a perfect 13-0 record and their sixth SEC championship under Nick Saban. I asked Coach Saban about Hurts' character after he decided to stay with the team even when Tua was named the starter back in September. I've probably never been more proud of a player than um, Jalen. you got to have a tremendous amount of character and class to put the team first, knowing that your situation is not what it used to be. Uh, and for a guy that's a great competitor, you know, that, that's, that's, that takes a lot. It's not easy to do. Uh, and I think this is a great example of why guys uh, don't need to run off and just transfer every chance they get or every time something doesn't work out. Jalen is going to be a more successful person in his life because of what he went through, not winning 26 games, but when he went through this year, trying to be the kind of person who had to support other people after he was a star player. You guys seen Jalen do this numerous of times, you know. For him to get his opportunity again tonight, I'm happy for him. And I think the team is happy for him as well, you know, for him to step in and do what he did. Also worth noting is how Alabama's defense responded. The tie gave up a season-high 21 points in the first half, and then another touchdown on Georgia's first possession in the second half. 28 was as much as the dogs would get as the Alabama defense kept UGA at bay the rest of the way. I just feel, uh, I mean, we set out our goals and we, we knew what we wanted to do. And we came out, I mean, the second half, I mean, first half didn't go too good. We came out, came out second half, made some adjustments, and cleaned things up. We came out with a victory. Listen, that's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Oh, we ain't done yet. It's only the beginning. It's just a pit stop right here. It, it, it's just a little bit. Hey, hey, it's a pit stop. It's just a gas we'll station. We'll see y'all in Cali. Just up a little bit. We'll, we'll see y'all in Cali, though. Before Cali and San Francisco for the national championship, the number one Tide will have to win their semifinal game. We'll find out if that's the Orange Bowl or the Cotton Bowl and who their opponent is tomorrow at noon Eastern. Reporting on your side, from Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Justin Holbrock, News 3 Sports. Not much remains of the 2018 SEC Championship game as the crews get the field ready for tomorrow's Falcons-Ravens game. But one thing we know is for certain, the Georgia Bulldogs are residents of the Heartbreak Hotel yet again after another double-digit second-half collapse against the Alabama Crimson Tide here at the Benz. Denied yet again. The Georgia Bulldogs were double-digit underdogs going into the SEC Championship game against an Alabama team that had beaten all 12 of its previous opponents by at least 20 points. But it was the Bulldogs who took control of the game early, with Jake Fromm and the Georgia offense putting up 21 points in the first half in a Bulldog defense, forcing Alabama into a position it had not been in since last year's national championship game, trailing at the half. Georgia came out of the blocks in the second half the same way they did in the first, forcing yet another three and out on defense and putting up another touchdown on offense. This time, a 23-yard strike from Jake Fromm to Riley Ridley and the 12-point underdog Dogs were leading 28-14 with only three minutes gone in the second half. The Georgia defense was having their best game of the season up to that point, holding Tua Tagovailoa to under 100 yards passing until a 51-yard touchdown pass to Jalen Waddle late in the third. Our goal was to trap them and keep them in the pocket. Um, you know, we had a lot of guys rushing with a lot of passion and you know, just a lot of determination to get those guys on the ground. It was still Georgia's game to win going into the fourth quarter. After Jalen Hurts came into the game and led Bama to the game-tying touchdown, Georgia still controlled his own destiny, getting the ball back on offense. The drive stalled at midfield where Kirby Smart gambled on Georgia's playoff hopes. Even with the Alabama defense in the game, Smart went for a fake punt on 4th and 11 from midfield, but Justin Fields quickly ran out of field to run and was taken down for a turnover on down. Thought it was there, it was there today. We were going to snap the ball quick and it took too long to snap the ball. They didn't have a guy covered, we had a guy wide open. And Alabama would drive down the short field with Hurt scoring what would be the deciding blow. Georgia's dreams of the college football playoff had been dashed. Instead, the attention shifted to what could have been for the Dolphins. 
uh, have said, uh, you know, it's really not for, for me to decide. Um, it's for them to decide, and I thought we played our butts off today, and um, can only can control what can control. Well, it boils down to one thing. Do you want the four best teams in or not? That's, that, it's that simple. You know, we sat at home last year and got to go to the game. And our best beat each other up, and they had a good football team. Give, give that coach across the sideline a vote who he doesn't want to play. It'll start with us. And I promise you, he don't want to play us. And uh, based on the teams that I've we've played this year, um, I think this team deserves to be in the, the playoff as well. Uh, I sure as hell don't want to play them again. All right, but um, that's that's the best compliment I can give you or give them. Nick Saban thinks the dogs should be in the playoffs. However, they'll likely go from Mercedes-Benz Stadium here in Atlanta to the Mercedes-Benz Superdome in New Orleans as the highest ranked SEC team not in the college football playoff in the Sugar Bowl. On your side, from Mercedes-Benz Stadium here in Atlanta, Jack Patterson, News 3 Sports. So with that, here's how the college football playoff shakes out. Alabama, of course, keeps the number one spot. Undefeated Clemson and Notre Dame snag the two and three seeds, while Oklahoma slides in at number four after beating Texas in the Big 12 championship. Before the year, many thought Auburn would have been one of those teams as a playoff contender. But after a 7-5 and five record, fans weren't even sure if Gus Malzahn would still be the coach. Today, longtime Auburn beat writer Philip Marshall is reporting Malzahn told his assistant coaches that he's returning next season. This comes after a week of speculation ranging from Malzahn being fired to accepting a reduction in his buyout and restrictions on paying assistant coaches. The report goes on to say what Malzahn agreed or didn't agree to is not certain, but that President Stephen Leith stands firm in his support of Malzahn. The Tigers will play in the Music City Bowl in Nashville against Purdue on December 28th. When the season started, the Marion County Eagles had four consecutive games on the road. Road. But that road game gauntlet jump started the Eagles' undefeated season, and they were going for their third straight home playoff win on Friday. Eagles in their third Final Four in six years. Marion County getting the party started on their first drive. Trice McCannon calls his own number, and number six has reservations for six. Eagles lead seven zip. Still in the first quarter, Panthers with the counter. Tyler Moorhead from three yards out, and we've got a tie ball game in the first. Second quarter, Panthers up 10-7. More of Moorhead, 30 yards for his second tutty of the game, and Clinch County goes up 17-7. Marion County responded with a field goal, so 320 left in the half. This time, Moorhead going to show off the arm, slings this one to Jeremiah Johnson, who shakes off the defender. Nothing but green grass. Clinch County takes a 24-10 lead right before the half. Marion County finds some life. Eagles in the red zone. The screen pass to Josh Rogers. Mr. Rogers finds the best neighborhood in the stadium, but they fall just short 31-23 to end their incredible season. We had two other Georgia teams trying to make it to the Benz. The Callaway Cavaliers season came to an end as they fell by six to Rockmart 28-22. Cavs still in search of their first ever state title. And the other team in Troop County, it's the Troop Tigers, but no luck for them as well. The Titans ran away with this semifinal matchup, beating Troop County 51-35. to Coming up on the last call, a pair of football coaches retire, one on the college level and another in high school. We'll take you through the careers of both Paul Johnson and Robert Maddox after the break. After 40 years of coaching, it's time to take a break. Those were the words of Georgia Tech head football coach Paul Johnson, who announced his retirement this week after the season. Johnson spent 11 of 22 head coaching years with the Yellow Jackets, where he racked up 82 wins, giving him the fourth most in school history. He retires with 189 career wins, the fourth most of any active coach in the FBS. The 7-5 and five Jackets are now in a bowl game, and it's Johnson's ninth and final with the team. There was also another retirement in football this week. This one comes from the high school level. Longtime football coach Robert Maddox is retiring as the head coach of Lee Scott. Maddox was a high school head coach for 24 years, but his head coaching career started in college at Troy State. He spent three seasons leading the Trojans, followed by seven years at his alma mater of Valley High School. Coach Maddox also spent four years at the helm at Auburn High and stayed in town to coach Lee Scott for 13 years. We also have some sad news to report in sports. Legendary local high school coach James Bubba Ball passed away at the age of 96 this week. Mr. Ball coached basketball at Baker High School for 15 years and led the team to two state championships in 1954 and 1956. 
He later coached at Hardaway and built the first athletic program at Shaw High School back in 1978. Incredible man and an incredible life. Let's go to the sport he loves. CSU hosting Albany State. Cougars going for their third straight win on the fast break. Bryant Givens give him a three. CSU's first points in the game, three to two. Two minutes later, Jalen Thomas, JT for three. Yes, the Cougars increase their lead. Then Givens weaving through traffic, swings it to Stanley Taylor. Everybody was hitting from three. Makes me think I could do it. But I can tell you one thing I can't do, and that's this. Givens pulls up, but it's not that, it's this. Oh my. Landrius Horton, one-handed putback slam jam. Thank you, ma'am. Take another look. Cougars led by as many as 17 in the first half, but it took, oh, took overtime to pull out the 79-76 win. Coming up, we've got Picks of the Week with myself and Jack Patterson. Welcome back to Picks of the Week. Look at this set. Man, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? The set looks <laughs> a lot better than it normally does. The poinsettias look pretty good. They're red, kind of like Georgia red, but it ran red with Georgia's blood in the SEC Championship as the Crimson Tide won the game. I'm sorry, Jack. I'm done talking about that. You've already heard me say enough about that in this show, okay? All right, let's go ahead and switch from college football to the NFL. We're picking any game in the NFL this week. Where are you going? I mean, at this point, the Falcons are a dumpster fire. Sure. And guess what? They're playing another dumpster fire in the Green Bay Packers, who just fired their coach. So uh, this is a toss-up, but the Falcons can't play in cold weather, as evidenced by their loss against the Cleveland Browns earlier this year. So go, Pat, go. Uh, the Cardinals can't play in cold weather either, and somehow they won today in Green Bay. So I'm going to go the other way. Why not? Let's take the Falcons. <laughs> All right, changing gears. We're doing the MLS Cup Final. Atlanta United will be hosting it against Portland. Jack, is this the first time that they win something in Atlanta? I'm praying. I'm praying. Five strikes. Please bring this home for the sanity of all Atlanta sports fans. Please. Please. United. Please. I do agree. I think that they're at home. They have the advantage. This team has been really a team of destiny since they started, and it's all culminated to this point. I think that they'll get the job done. Portland, a very talented team, but United, likewise, and they just beat the best team in the entire MLS to get there in the New York Red Bulls. Please. So finally, we're not doing a personal pick this week because it is Army versus Navy, and that trumps all things. So where are you going? According to Connor, anyway. That game, <laughs> by the way, you can see right here on CBS Saturday at 3 o'clock. Yep. Uh, I'm going with Army because I don't really know much about Army besides the fact that they almost beat Oklahoma and they're in the playoffs. So. And Navy got destroyed by Notre Dame. That they did, and I think Army has a better team this year as well. The Knights just better than the midshipmen men have been all throughout the season. All right, we've also got picks from Rex and Connor. Go ahead. All right, for Connor, yeah, he's taking the Falcons over the Packers. He's taking Portland over Atlanta United, and he's taking Army over Navy like me. All right, we're rounding it out with a clean sweep. Army over Navy for Rex. He's taking his Texans to beat the Colts. And finally, the Bucks beat the Panthers. <laughs> finally, he's taking Atlanta United over Portland. So Connor, the only guy taking Portland over your United Five Strike. He's a smart Atlanta fan, that's why. <laughs> that he is. All right, that's it for Picks of the Week. We'll be right back after this. In two months, Atlanta will host the Super Bowl. But first, A-Town and the Benz will be the site of the 2018 MLS Cup. On Thursday, United lost to the New York Red Bulls 1-0, but won the Eastern Conference Championship on aggregate 3-1. This is the first MLS Cup appearance for the Five Stripes, who will play Portland at 8 Eastern next Saturday. We couldn't be more excited. And one of the reasons we're going to be there is because of you. Our fans have been incredible. And I know next Saturday will be unbelievable as well. God bless you and look forward to seeing you next week. United joined the MLS as an expansion team in April of 2014. And now they're one game away from winning the cup. Staying in Atlanta, the Braves made quite the day on Cyber Monday. Their shopping spree included popular catcher and 2017 World Series champion Brian McCann, who signed a one-year deal. But it didn't stop there. Atlanta also signed former 2015 American League MVP and Auburn alum Josh Donaldson, who was dealing with a calf injury playing only 113 games, but quite the sale on Cyber Monday. Jack and I were in the Benz, and then they changed it for the Falcons after the SEC title. The rookie Lamar Jackson in for the touchdown, and the Ravens have a 7-0 lead. Baltimore driving again, but Jackson is hit, and the ball is out. Vic Beasley there to scoop it up. Looks like he's going to be taken down, but no. We know he's pretty quick off the edge, and 
He is in the open field too. He gone, weaving through traffic, makes it all the way for the 74-yard touchdown. First score of the game for Atlanta, 10-7. Four Justin Tucker field goals later, it's 19-10. And then the play of the game, Patrick Onwasara leaps over a body, strips the rock. Tavon Young, I'll take that. And the Falcons fall 26-16. Last on the last call, Vanderbilt tight end Turner Cockrell passed away this week at the age of 21 from cancer. Coming up, his former high school teammate has a tribute you have to see. This week, Vanderbilt tight end Turner Cockrell died from cancer at the age of 21. His high school teammate Brandon Rainey honored him by wearing his number 82 and scored the first touchdown of the game for the Citadel and honored his teammate by pointing to the sky and taking a knee. Really, that's what it's all about. That's it for the last call. Same time next week.